two summers ago, local man Derek Batten was driving through this village, Alderton, near Northampton, when he was surprised to see a sign advertising a castle and a moat for sale. He was intrigued because he didn't even know there was a castle around here. To cut a long story short, he bought it. And this is what he got for his money. The remains of what's thought to be a Norman castle, which as you can see, is almost completely covered in trees. Naturally, having bought it, he wanted to find out more about it, but he didn't have much success, which is why he contacted Time Team. He wants to know who built it, when it was built, and how much of it remains. And as usual, Time Team have got just three days to find out. Derek, I've walked all the way round your site, and <laughs> I reckon you've been conned. No, no, he hasn't. It's, it's, There's no <laughs> castle, it's just a little hill. <laughs> it's very definitely what we'd expect for a Norman castle. You can see it's under the trees, but you can see the, the moat, and the rest of it is hidden under the trees, but it's what we'd expect. You have to take all estate agents' particulars with a pinch of salt, but this <laughs> said castle and moat. I reckon I've got a moat, I can see that, and this expert tells me yeah, I've got I a mean, castle, it's, it's what we'd so I am been con. It's what we'd expect for a Norman castle. What sort of castle is it? Well, I think it's probably a ring work. Is that what we call a modern bailey? No, no, if you come and look at Victor's drawings, look, you can see the, the sort of two basic types of Norman castle. This is a modern bailey, look, with a big mound with a timber tower on the top, and around the bottom, one or more baileys, which have got the domestic buildings in. Whereas a ring work is a much more flattened mound with all the buildings on the top. So are we going to be looking for the remains of buildings up there somewhere? Yeah, we're going to be looking on the top and we're going to be looking at the bank and ditch because they'll tell us something about when it was built. It's not surprising most people don't know there's a castle here. It's almost completely covered by trees. Thankfully, Derek has cleared some of the overgrowth in the interior of the castle where GFIs are working. But our surveyor, Bernard, has got quite a battle on his hands recording the contours of the site so that we can see what it looks like without any trees. Look, it's five past eleven on day one. Yeah. This must be some kind of a record. We've already got a trench going in. Yeah, the reason is we need to get right to the bottom of the ditch, so we need the full three days to do it. Phil! How's this trench I mean, going? Very, very well, actually, Tony. Uh, we've already got through the main disturbance, the, the, the recent disturbance, and we're already into ditch fills, and mainly we've actually got medieval pottery. Oh, right. What have you got? Yeah, what we've got here, we've got a, a mixture of stuff in the topsoil, but underneath uh, we've got a couple of bits of a medieval roof tile and a couple of bits of medieval pottery, late 13th to 14th century, so we're definitely into archaeology here. But this place wouldn't have been built in the late 13th or 14th century, would it? No, but the evidence for if it's a Norman castle is going to be much further down in the ditch. The castle's a protected ancient monument, but because so little's known about it, we've been given permission to dig in specific areas of the site. Why have you said that we should dig here in order to find out more about the moat than anywhere else? Well, we looked at all different locations, and if you see on this photo, you can see we've got the modern road by the side of the castle. We think that's on the medieval line, but in more recent centuries, there's been dumping of rubble and other rubbish in the moat in this area, so we thought, move around to an area where there's less contamination, so it's the best place to dig. And um, what other areas are you going to let us dig in? Well, we've agreed you can look in three areas. Uh, this, this trench in, in the moat itself, uh, one on the bank and one inside the castle. Is that actually going to be enough to tell us what we want to know? Well, it should be, because we're actually looking very carefully to place these trenches where they'll give the maximum amount of information for the minimum amount of disturbance of the site. The digging strategy was agreed weeks ago. It's just the precise location of each trench that needs to be decided now. We reckon somewhere here, Tony, through here. We're going to put a trench from here all the way up to here. Up this slope and then over the back here into the interior. 
Uh, you have uh, to how are we going to do it? Is it technically yeah, possible? Yeah, hang on to the roots. That's the best way when you get up. You'll never get up. It's we can't have to... archaeologists just hanging on to roots for three <laughs> days, Mick. <laughs> well, Mick will rig some sort of system up, I've no doubt, won't you, Mick, to yes. be able to get us, to get us up here? I'll, I'll, I'll try. <laughs> so, trench number two here to investigate how and when the rampart was constructed. Which leaves us with one last area to investigate the interior of the castle. Yeah. We got the due first, John? Yeah, but it's a bit disappointing, Tony. We're seeing lots of tree roots and we're not seeing much more detail than you can actually see in the earthworks themselves. Yeah. Yeah. How do you feel about that, Stuart? I'm, I'm quite pleased in a way because there are, that platform is very distinctive. To me, that, that's as good an evidence as John normally gets with, with thick hard lines on yeah. his drawing. That's got shape and form to it. And as an earthwork, that suggests there's a building or some sort of structure gone on over there. So are you saying that the earthworks are doing for us what geophys so often does. I think so in this case, yeah. And what we had to rely on in the days before geophysics, <laughs> some of us remember. So work begins across the earthwork, which might be the remains of a building in the interior of the castle. While a short distance away, digging has started on the rampart, on the easy part of the trench, leaving a bit more time to think about this. I've got a camera of my own this week, and I'm going to talk to some of the people who you rarely hear from, like the diggers. Stuart? Yes? Have you dug a castle before? No. No, no. Very rare opportunity to dig a castle. Have you come across anything yet that's excited you? Well, the whole site's exciting. <laughs> Is our English heritage inspector excited? I had to ask. I think I probably am. This is a class of monument we know very little about, and the opportunity to actually find out how it works is, it comes along very rarely. We're also going to be investigating one of the gardens that back onto the castle, because local rumour has it that some burials were discovered here when a sewer pipe was laid a few years ago. Oh, the smell is really <laughs> bad. <laughs> As the gardens a good distance from the village graveyard, it's possible the burials are part of an earlier cemetery, perhaps associated with the castle. This is our incident room, which is the local village hall. And here's Stuart beavering away. What are you coming up with? Well, it's air photographs which show a big complex of earthworks around the castle. You see the castle there? We can't some of the trees. Just here. That's it there. But you see all around here, there are all these other earthworks. And these may give us some clues as to which comes first here, whether the castle is dropped into an already existing landscape or whether these other things are built around the castle. I'm going to try and unravel all these layers. So what are you actually going to be doing? Lots of walking. <laughs> See you later. <laughs> Here's Ray San. Hello. Well, this is interesting. What have you got? This is Bernard's survey data. We're mapping it. It's the interior of the castle. So even though I could hardly interpret it at all because it was so covered in trees, by the end of the third day, I ought to be able to make some sense of it because of what you've done. Hopefully. The model clearly shows the earthwork we're digging inside the castle. And as Bernard collects more survey data, we'll be able to show all the lumps and bumps that make up the site, especially the shape of the huge ditch which surrounds the castle. Well, Derek, here's your castle ditch. Well, it's incredible. <laughs> How do you feel about incredible. it now? <laughs> Gosh, you've done some work. What on earth made you buy the castle in the first place? Well, there are moments in my life when I've wondered that myself over the last couple of years or so, but I've got an interest in local history, a bit of an interest in archaeology, and I thought it would be something that I could develop in my declining years. I mean, there you are, you're driving through the village and you suddenly see this sign that says for sale. What on earth happened when you went home and said, I think I'm going to buy a castle? Well, I must say, Bridget's quite used to me coming home with a lot of eccentric ideas from time to time, and I think she just shrugged her shoulders. <laughs> <laughs> Having summoned up some courage, Mick the Digs currently testing his system for digging the steep side of the rampart. But now I want to talk to Robin. Is there a chance we can find out from the documents who built the castle? 
Not precisely. They didn't need planning permission in those days in quite the normal sense. The earliest record we've got for this place, Alderton, is the Doomsday Book of 1086, and that's common for a lot of places in England. Uh, what we do know is that by that time, 1086, uh, William the Conqueror had granted the manor to his half-brother, Robert, Count of Mortain, who became almost overnight after the conquest the wealthiest landowner in England, bar the king and the church. So you reckon this Robert... Count of Mortain could probably have built the castle. I think it's most likely. He was a, a, a prominent Norman baron, and he was the kind of person who needed to keep his thumb on the newly conquered population who were ready to revolt at a moment's notice. But kind of person isn't very hard evidence, is it? Could it have been built later? Well, there is one other period, the anarchy during the reign of King Stephen. Which is what, 60 the years 11, later? 1130s, 1140s. Yeah. It's the period of Brother Cadfael on the telly, you know. And they were building castles then? They were very definitely building castles because effectively civil war had broken out between Stephen and his rival, the Empress Matilda. So those are the two possible periods, yes. So it's from the 1070s, 80s and the 1130s, 40s that we ought to be looking for evidence from. But my money's on the early period. Well, the pottery finds from the castle so far are telling us that the site was still in use in the 1300s. But the big surprise today is the large number of pottery finds discovered in our trench in the back garden. Naturally, Cathy and many of her neighbours want to know more about them. How can you tell, looking at the pieces, what age they are and... and where they've come from? Well, you've got lots of different variations in pottery which add up to the identification. I mean, this piece, for instance, is uh, a medieval jar or cooking pot rim. It's a very distinctive shape. Mm. The main way of identifying it is what we call the inclusions. It's the different minerals and other bits and bobs that we find in the clay. This piece was made up at Liveden or Stanion, up in the northeast of Northamptonshire. Again, the inclusions, the bits of fossil shell in it, are much bigger and not as well distributed within the clay, which is very distinctive mm. of that industry. We've also had a um, fair bit of animal bone, sort of lots of domestic animals of all sorts. Um, so, I mean, it is early days, but we're wondering whether some of the stories of bones being found in the pipe trench might relate to these. It's nearly the end of day one. How does Professor Aston reckon it's all going? Well, this one here, we're still taking the topsoil off. Yeah. So that's the that's going to be through the rampart. That's going to be a three-dayer, that one, isn't uh, well, it? Well, I think so, because it's so slow. But here, this is already beginning to produce really quite nice archaeology. Now, you say it's producing nice archaeology. Look, yeah. can, am I allowed to get in? Uh, you better ask Katie. No, she says no. Why can... not? All it is <laughs> is a great big tumble. I've just lovingly troweled all this, so you can't come in. Well, tell me what's there. Well, we've just taken a whole load of rubble off, which has got lots of 14th century tyre and stuff. This is the roof tile we've yeah. just seen down there, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. And now Same green, green glaze stuff, look. Uh -huh. Yeah, and now? And now we're coming down onto pits in there. I can't see a pit. Show me a pit. And you see the black and the yellow? No. You're treading in the trench. Yes, I'm allowed to. I'm professional. Oh. You can see the edge there? Yeah. And there's lots of black material, a bit of tile, charcoal, so it's probably a rubbish pit of some sort. They, they Finally, just enough time to see what's trench. happening in the garden for myself. Crikey, this has got deeper since this morning. Oh, we've been working <laughs> very hard. Jenny, what have we got in here? Well, it's all turned out to be a lot more complicated than we thought it would be. We were hoping that there'd be some human bones, and there doesn't seem to be at the moment. But we have got several really interesting features. In the bottom, we found the sewer pipe that was what led us here originally. I think I can smell it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, but under that, it seems to be cutting through a really big pit that's full of lots of organic stuff and a lot of animal bones. So that might be where the rumour started. But over here, there's a very strange feature um, that looks as if it's early medieval, maybe 12th century. We've had this... Um, lovely big oh, piece of that. cooking yeah. pot which Paul thinks is very early so we don't really know quite what's going on but it's certainly very exciting whatever it is. It looks as if it, it's almost part of a settlement you know sort of pre-village or something that went with a castle mound doesn't it? Yeah it looks domestic definitely yeah. with all the animal yeah. bone and some of the pots been in the fire and that sort of thing. I know from the way that they're talking, that they're going to say, can we extend the trench tomorrow? <laughs> yeah, that right? was the next thing, yeah. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> How would you feel if we made it bigger? I'm quite open to it. Even if it went as far as, as, far the, as patio. the patio? They say that the bones are somewhere between here and the patio, so if it's the patio has to go, 
It has to go. <laughs> Beginning of day two, and it's not until you start climbing up these ramparts that you realise the sheer scale of this place. When I first got here, it seemed like a little hill, but I now realise this castle is a massive structure. And we're going to try and take a whole slice out of the ramparts over there. And the archaeology in the middle there is incredibly complicated. It's going to be touch and go whether or not we can finish in time. This trench across the ramparts tricky to say the least, and it looks a bit scary. We're also digging across the huge moat, but it's going to be some time before we get to the bottom of it to establish when it was first dug. In the interior of the castle, we're widening the trench over the earthwork that may be the remains of a building. And not far away, we're digging in a garden that backs onto the castle and we've opened up a second trench in search of the burials supposedly seen some years ago when a sewer pipe was put in. At the moment though, Jen is excited because the pit full of pottery discovered yesterday has turned out to be a big ditch. Paul, the pottery expert, looked at the pottery yeah. from part of the fill and at the moment he thinks it's the earliest feature he's seen here the last couple of days because it's all looking as if it's 12th century material. Oh, right. So what we really want to know is why, why a big ditch here? Mm. So you want Stuart to look at the maps? <laughs> I think we do. Yeah. <laughs> well, we've already looked at the maps and the air photographs. Yeah. And there are ditches in that field just beyond the hedge, which yeah. I've been interested in since I first came yeah. here. One of them actually heads in this direction. Right. Oh, I wonder it? whether this is part of some kind of annex. Right. Or enclosure associated with the... What, are you thinking of something remote? stuck on the side well, of the castle mound, are that, you? Yeah. How's the trench going? Oh, really well. Really, really well. I mean, I bet from up there it looks really impressive, doesn't it? Uh, it just looks like someone digging the road. <laughs> Look, it's a imagine. Look at the size of this, right down in here. I'm poor devil attacking you. And you're heaving rocks down on me. I mean, <laughs> it is impressive. And the main thing is, now what we're doing is we're going to um, just find the other edge. We've got it, and then we can empty it out. In the interior trench, progress is slow but sure, as we work our way through layers that may relate to different phases of building on this platform. Working with a metal detectorist, we can be sure we're not missing any small finds in the dark soil. Look at that. That's lovely. Mm. Just got to find the casket that goes with it now. Meanwhile, Derek's keen for our pottery specialist to see the finds he's collected from around the site over the last couple of years. Well, it's for such a small collection of pottery, it's quite remarkable. Yeah. Um, we start up here, we're in the late Iron Age, around about 200, 100 BC. Gosh! <laughs> <laughs> we move to this piece, it's yeah. probably, probably a base of a big storage vessel. We move to this piece, it's what you'd call Belgic, or what used to be called Belgic, late Iron Age into early Roman, say yeah. 50 AD. We come down the bottom, and now we're into the Saxon period. This, this little piece is uh, early or middle Saxon. This is the grotty dog biscuit. Also <laughs> if sort of you want to be rude about oh, it, yeah, yeah, I happen to like so, the stuff. <laughs> <laughs> so when you say early to middle Saxon, what sort of dates are you talking about? 450 from? to 850 AD. Really? Uh, Derek's collection includes medieval pottery and roof tile belonging to a building that was here in the 14th or early 15th century. It's all local stuff. Does this surprise you, the range of material you've got it from this It certainly does. Because, I, mean, I mean, this is a surprise. It's absolutely. prehistoric, isn't it? Uh, I mean, there are Roman uh, settlements in this part of the world, but this prehistoric stuff is really exciting. Looking at this pottery, this suggests you've had people on this mound from about 200 BC to about the 15th century. Stuart thinks the shape of the castle suggests the Normans reused an existing site. It's a very odd shape and it looks to me as if it's actually reusing an enclosure of some type. It's, it's almost triangular. Yeah. It's got this very pronounced curve round here and yet it's got this very straight side along here making the whole thing almost triangular shaped. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I what quite, do you think? I quite agree. Um, the, I can't see any reason on the ground why that should turn through that immensely sharp angle, more than the right angle. Mm -hmm. It's very difficult to imagine them building if they were starting 
from scratch and much better if it's running along there mm -hmm. and around here right. and they're actually chopping off something that exists yeah. already. Stuart reckons the original ditch enclosed the top of the hill like this and may have been an Iron Age hill fort or a Saxon defended site called a burr. The Normans simply cut off one end of the enclosure, resulting in a castle looking something like this. To our experts, the sheer size of it suggests it was built very soon after the Norman conquest, when Robert of Mortain owned the manor. The locals are already paying their rents and, and their obligations to, to a Saxon landlord. Yep. So to some extent it's a change of landlord, isn't it? Uh, but if, if there's... Uh, now, now you've got the, the big boss right on your doorstep. Would Robert of Mortain actually have lived here? Well, I mean, he had nearly 800 manors. Uh, I mean, I'm sure some of them he never went to in his entire life. Uh, so it's, it's quite possible that he never came here. Although we only know of three castles that he built. And this is the only one in this, this part of this neck of the woods. And so I'd like to think he might have dropped in on a couple of occasions at the, at the very least. Yeah. How many people would have lived and worked in that castle? Probably, when the Lord wasn't there, there would be an administrative staff to make sure that all the rents came in, yeah. of yeah. perhaps six or seven people. Mm -hmm. And then there'd be a curation staff, as we might call them, of a porter to make sure that nobody walked off with anything, and two or three people to keep it clean. So you're really looking at a sort of dozen. How would this castle have affected the lives of the ordinary people who lived around here? It might have had some good spin-off, because uh, here are people with money, and where there is money, then people can normally pick up something for selling cabbages or, yeah, or yeah. Um, chickens. But presumably they would have been involved in the construction, wouldn't they? They'd have had to, yeah. would, they, would they press local gang labor. local labour into? Yeah, the, uh, if we're talking in the conquest period, the Anglo-Saxons had a tax and obligation to do works mm. for their landlord. And the Normans seem to have simply said, well, we are landlords, now you build a castle, so go ahead and start digging. They're all saying you've got a good find. Yes, yeah, we have. I think it's the uh, the bottom of the scabbard of a dagger, and it's called a chape. So is, is the chape just the bottom bit then? Yeah, yeah, it's, it's, the, it's the piece of metalwork that you get on the bottom of a leather scabbard, and I think that's probably what that is. To stop the knife going through the scabbard? Through the bottom. The entrance to the castle is thought to be here. But we weren't planning to dig in this area because of a long-running boundary dispute between Derek and his neighbours. However, having spent a couple of hours talking to them separately, I now reckon it can be sorted out. Derek, where did you say you thought that your land should end? I think my land ends at the end of the scheduled ancient monument itself, the bottom of this bank down here. And Marie, where are you saying that it should end? Where the rope is. Just over here. That's, That's right. some difference, isn't it? What we're suggesting is that you should split it 50-50. You see this, uh, this orange mark down here? If the line came through there, right down to there, and then across there, how would you feel about that? Well, we've you... got a compromise and I'm happy with that. I'm, I'm happy, happy. with that. After two years? After yes. two years. Time team has solved the problem for us. <laughs> Are you prepared to shake on it? Yes. Oh, yes. give him a kiss. <laughs> Brilliant. And we've got the landowner's permission to look for the gateway. This hollow in the rampart looks favourite, but we're going to do a radar survey to make sure. The agreement with the English Heritage Inspector was to ring him should anything like this crop up. He says he's there. We can't reach him. Mick makes a decision. He gave us 50 metres. We've only used 24, so we've got another 26 to go out. So we're well within the... Uh, and Glenn's OK in it, so... I think, I think we, go, we go ahead. The landowners are relieved. This is much better than fighting it out in court. Phil, brave man that he is, has agreed to play the part of a Saxon soldier in a demonstration of how effective the Norman cavalry were at the Battle of Hastings. What we're going to try and do today is to give you some idea of what it's like to face a Norman warrior on this, the ultimate killing war machine of the day. Yeah? This is a Spanish stallion, 15 hands, typical of the sort of thing that Norman knights were riding at Hastings. 
what you'll be experiencing is what the Saxon warriors felt like as they were couched behind these walls trying to see off these machines. And, I mean, I feel like I'm a Norman. Am I, am I really a Saxon as well? Virtually no difference in kit at the time, yeah? A lot of Saxons would have looked a lot like Normans. Even this Norman face guard helmet was worn by a lot of Saxons. Now, be honest with me. Do you have psychopathic tendencies? <laughs> <laughs> Norman war stallions were highly trained, even taught to bite in battle. But the first part of training was to get the horse to go against its natural instincts and gallop at the opposition rather than away from them. In combat, of course, I'm going to try and always keep this side of myself, the shield side, to you, yes? Right. Because the moment I stop then around I here, can go e you can see how vulnerable I am. I'm just another infantryman, right. and here I, I am, there. it's an easy target. So in combat, I'm always, and this is where the training of the horse is crucial, trying to keep this side, use my shield, right. yeah? push you back, and you haven't got <laughs> any chance at all. Hey, you didn't tell, you didn't tell me about that. <laughs> I thought you were going to hit me on the shield. That's cheating. Why well, do you think we could give you a helmet? The typical Norman rules, I know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> would, would, would I be able to, to stab the horse? You wouldn't think twice about it, yeah? You would be trying to kill the horse because if the horse is dead, then the rider is very vulnerable. And, and you didn't think enough of your horse to put armour on that as well? It was a trade-off between mobility and speed and protection. But now the training session's over, time for Phil to stand up for all Englishmen and face a full-on Norman cavalry charge. Oh my God! <laughs> Stand firm, Phil. You know you can do it! <laughs> and then we're back in. You're on your own. Ah. <laughs> That is absolutely terrifying. Well, that's the whole bloody <laughs> idea, Phil. <laughs> can we have a truce? I think we can. <laughs> a change in the weather, but it's not stopping us working. Let's have a look. The geophys is looking promising. The blue and red lines on the radar screen indicate substantial stonework under the ground that might be the remains of the gateway into the castle. While over in the rampart trench, we've come down onto evidence relating to the construction of the castle. Philip, any ideas? Well, I think there's a line of stones across there. There's a darker patch beyond. There are stones like that across there, yeah. and they all seem to be part of the construction of, of the rampart. And that's good, because once they're taken out, we might be able to find out how it's built, and if they left any rubbish behind, we could tell when it was built. Surprisingly, French pottery is rarely found in early Norman castles. Much of the pottery we've unearthed is made locally. This is a rim of a 14th century jar in use towards the end of the castle's life. While this fragment, found in the garden trench, is earlier and dates to the 12th century. The ditch discovered in the garden continues to turn up early finds. Yeah. Oh, damn, look at that. What's what that? is it? It's a metal. Oh, it's a knife or something. Paul? Oh. Yeah. Wow. It's hard to see because of the mud. But once it's cleaned up, it's clear that this is a small knife, early Norman in date, and in use probably around 1100. Jenny, how's it coming oh, on? Pretty good. Cool. Yes. I mean, that's a big hole. It is. Yeah, we've um, we've got the sides of the ditch now, and we're getting. We thought we were getting towards the bottom, but Simon's just put a rod down there, and it's already a, over a meter deep, and there's another meter and a half it's down a there. Bit deep in, isn't Very it? Very deep. Yeah. Have we any idea what date it is? Well, the pottery has given us quite a nice little story. Um, we're fairly sure that it was backfilled after 1150, 
but before 12.25, 12.50 at the absolute latest. That's rather good, isn't it, to have dates di as good as that? It's quite tight, yeah. And yeah. what we're also getting is bits of late Saxon pottery kicking about in the fill. Right. Uh, this bowl, for instance, was probably made no later than 10.50. So there was something going on before the Normans so got here. So there's some settlement in this area. Yeah, then. it looks right. very much like it from the pottery. Do we think that implies that it was dug during the Saxon times? It's still possible, but I think it's as likely that it's part of the first Norman castle, an outer uh -huh. courtyard of the ah, right. Norman castle, yeah. which is being abandoned 150 years after it was cut, and all the pottery which has been lying around is thrown into the ditch to fill it up. So what's the Saxon pottery doing inside it? One may well suppose that there's some Saxon houses around here with their rubbish pits. Still no sign of any burials, but we're going to check under the patio as promised. But so far, so good. End of day two, and plenty of finds to show the villagers, and the promise of much more to come tomorrow. Day three and it's our last chance to crack the mysteries of our Norman castle. This is the best part of the site to be in because, cheers Murray, apart from anything else we get an endless supply of tea. It's this trench where we're hoping to find the entrance to the castle. I don't think I've ever been the tea boy on time team before, but here you are lads. You've got to oh, drink up and keep working because we've only got a, a few hours left. There's good news to report from our trench across the rampart because it's looking like we're starting to find dating material. We're actually digging out this slot here, the tongue shaped slot we found oh, last yeah. night. Yeah, yeah. We're cleaning it out, we're sort of doing a half section of it, and we've just found these two shares of pottery. Oh, right. Well, this bit's uh, late Saxon, about 900 to 1100. Um, this other piece is um, a little bit later, 11th, 12th century thereabouts, but it all still dates to round about the time of the construction of the castle. But the real excitement this morning is in the incident room, where Derek's about to see his site for the very first time without any trees in the way. Oh, look at that. <laughs> oh, yes. I and mean, what, what it is illustrating really well is, is the earthwork form of the, the monument. It's the rampart along the top and along there. This section has been destroyed here. It also shows the platform, which we started to put a trench in just there. If you look from from that direction, yes. you'll, you'll, you'll see a, a, a different picture as well. Oh, God. Look, right. you, can see, you can see the regularity of that platform yeah. very, very yeah. clearly up there. And, and look at that terrace coming around the inside of the rampart all the way around there. Now, that to me, that indicates the whole series of buildings yeah. along the inside of the rampart and probably down, down, yeah. down here as yeah. well. And very striking is this depression here in the middle of this side where the the entrance is. All I can do is take an aerial photograph of the area and drop the model into it. <laughs> yeah, yes. so yes. You can see it quite clearly then, can't you? Yeah. Again, it looks, it looks fantastic without the trees on it, doesn't, it, doesn't it? it? To see what it would have looked like. Yeah. I mean, in, in the, seeing it here in the landscape context it also allows you to, to visualise this annex tacked onto the edge of the ring mot yeah. there, yes. um, with the entrance into the main ring mot here, just this side of it, yeah. the entrance facing the church across the way there. And in the ditch that went around the annex, we now have an environmentalist at work. Using an auger, we should find out how deep the ditch is and collect some soil samples which hopefully might tell us something about what was going on around here 900 or so years ago. This is the edge of it. In the gateway trench, Phil's making good progress. He reckons he's found the edge of something here and possibly another edge of it on the far side of the trench. Look here what's happening here. And this is where we're getting really quite excited. You see these big stones? And that looks like it could be another edge for something which is dipping away on this side as well. It's early days, but our castle expert thinks this looks promising too. This is the first th time in this cutting that I can see some sign of structure coming I think this is. I think this is very exciting. Looks much more like a natural collapse with the big stones rolling in. And if there is an entrance in this area, I would put my money on that hole. Why is it so important to try and find the entrance? Well, because entrances are sensitive things. If somebody's going to rebuild their castle, they very often start with the entrance. So if it's got two or three rebuildings, you'll very often pick up traces of that at the entrance area. Suddenly, though, we've got a problem. The English Heritage Inspector's arrived and is less than happy about this trench across the gateway. 
everything's ground to a halt at the moment. The guy in the dark blue is the man from English Heritage and he's the one who gives us permission to dig here and he wasn't able to be here yesterday but today he's come in and he's not at all happy about what's going on. And we're going to have to resolve this pretty quickly because we've only got three quarters of a day left. It's already been an hour while they've been deep in conversation. Meanwhile, outside the ancient monument and totally unaffected by this drama, Jenny's finding out about the environmental samples taken from the ditch in the back garden. So what are, what are all the little black things that are coming up then? Well, there's a lot of very short, rounded, fat wheat grains and um, they're what I call more of a club wheat. And what, what sort of things would people be doing with that type of wheat? Well, they probably would have been making bread with it. Um, oh, great. And this type of wheat would make, say, a better bread than emma wood, emma wheat, which is common in the Roman period. Uh, it makes a bread that rises much better, has oh, yeah. more gluten in it. Mm. Yeah. But they are, would also have used it in pottage, which is like a, like a stew. Sort with, of casserole. Yeah, and, and pulses and things like that, and vegetables. This is the trench that wasn't in the research design. After a full and frank exchange of views, the English Heritage Inspector now approves of the gateway trench, despite the fact that it wasn't part of our original plan. I have to be convinced that it's really essential, and I was convinced that there's a good academic reason for looking at this area. What would happen if you got it wrong? I'd get shouted at. Which is why you were shouting at us. That's right. Which is the way of the world. <laughs> oh, did that just come up? Yeah. Oh, let's have a look. Oh, oh, even wow, while we are lovely. talking, another find. Look at that, Philip. Isn't that lovely? Yeah. Any Isn't idea what it is? Nice? Yeah, um, it's a shield and it's got on it... it looks like a eagle. coat of arms. It is fact. a coat of arms yeah. with an eagle on it and a bar across. And it's been secured to something, probably a leather belt, and it's got a hinge in it so that it will swing. It's enamel. Have you seen anything like that before, Glenn? Yes, but they only come from very high quality sites. Yep. What, ah. do you, what do you think it is? Uh, it's, a bit, it's a bit of horse harness chopping. Yep. So what, what date would that be? Mm. Late 14th, early 15th century. Yeah. Right. And uh, they're not particularly common, and if we're looking for the entrance, this, this probably helps find it. Yep. Well, finding this is a bit better than rowing over the site. It's better it? get it Absolutely. in a bag so the conservator <laughs> can have a look at it. <laughs> this is a great find, and under the microscope, you can see how vivid the colours must have been. Oh, that was red, wasn't it? That's barred air, it's also red. So we have a red bar crossing the eagle. So it would have been really quite a... A very, bright, a very bright object. Victor's illustration shows it in context, but I've asked him to do another drawing, this time showing a 15th century knight in the gateway of the castle. We've lost a lot of time today, so now it's a question of working without breaks if we're going to tell Derek as much as we can about his castle. One question that occurs to me is why build a castle here in the first place? Isn't it a bit out of the way? This is interesting, Stu, because although it's not on a main road, it's on a ridgeway, but it joins up these two main roads. I mean, look at this now, <laughs> the, the yeah. Watling Street. Uh, you know, they're, wow. they're only a mile off that. Yeah, indeed, yeah. And we know that this road is actually one of the, well, one of the great roads of Roman and Saxon and medieval Indeed, England. indeed. Look at it, sort of straight as a dike, heading for, yeah. towards Shropshire that way. Look. Don't see any better example of a, a massive Roman road going straight across the straight, countryside. Straight across country. It's terrific, isn't straight, it? Straight beyond, going off across there. Looking back now, our village is a, is a mile from this road and a mile from the other the great north road on yeah. the other side. On the high ground in between. Yeah. From there, you will be able to see the castle on the hill. Absolutely. Be now, but it would be dominant yeah. up there, wouldn't it? We've lots of people arriving on site now. Time to start collecting our thoughts about the archaeology unearthed over the last three days. First, the trench across the rampart. On this side, it looks from what they've dug that there's um, a slot across where a timber was, more timbers to brace it out, and probably a wooden platform held up by what we've got down there. So you've got palisade, you've got 
earth butted right up against it, yep. and then behind that, a walkway, wooden a walkway. walkway. That's right, yep. So can we now solve our mystery of whether or not it was built in the Norman times when they first landed, just after 1066, yep. or whether it was built 80 or so years later in the time of Matilda and Stephen? I think we can, because there's quite a lot of material that's come out so far, and it's all belonged to the earlier rather than the later horizons. So I, I suspect that we are pretty close to saying that it's early. Give us a date. 1070. Well, we solved that one, haven't we? <laughs> Lucky we did get dating evidence from the rampart, because the story with the moat is that it's been regularly cleaned out over the years, and surprisingly, we've got very few finds out of it. But post-excavation work may tell us when the ditch was first dug. Although we've not got a significant amount of pottery, we're really lucky because there's some organic deposits down there, and we might just get a C14 date. Well, we did get a radiocarbon date for this sample, and it dated between 1020 and 1270 AD, which means the ditch wasn't dug in the Iron Age. But it could still be a Saxon ditch that was reused by the Normans. We've also been digging another big ditch here in the garden. Time for a final report from there. Kind of good and bad. The bad news is that we haven't found the bodies under the patio. There's nothing there. I don't feel too worried about that, actually. No, because I think the good news is that what we found is actually a lot more interesting. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I don't know what you think, but we've got lots and lots of pot. Yeah. Well, it's, it's a remarkable collection from, from one garden, isn't it? I mean, you presumably had no idea whether it's under your garden. Absolutely no idea. <laughs> so what are you going to do now? Dig the rest up? Make a swimming pool. <laughs> <laughs> In some ways, the biggest challenge has been sorting out the interior of the castle. Ask any digger. Stuart, when I talked to you first, you were dead excited about digging your first castle. Has yeah. it lived up to expectations? It has, yeah. It's been very tiring and very rewarding. Have you learnt anything? Um, I've learnt that the archaeology inside these structures is very, very complicated. Experienced time team digger Katie Hurst has got the job of sorting it out. This is the platform here. So that is that a natural edge there? Is that natural stone? Or no, this, I think this has been deliberately put here. Uh, it's, a, it's a nice, strong sort of revetment for, for this platform. For, for, this, for this flat platform yeah. to put so a building on. So basically, this is, the, this is the edge of the platform. Right, here. yeah. So, and all this, all this yellow stuff is redeposited natural, which has been put here to... So they've bored it in to build up... Yeah. So, and is this then a building put on top of it? This is a, a, a slot for some timber. So we've got to imagine a great big square or whatever timber in there with, with timber wall plates put into it. Yeah. Yeah. OK, that's all brilliant, but then yeah. it all goes to pot when right. we come in here. <laughs> because... Um, Although we found a few small post holes, we're missing the big ones required to support a large building with a heavy tiled roof. We think no. it's a substantial building yeah. because we've got lots of tile. That's all the roofing tile that I saw earlier. Yeah, so you're yeah. going to need something pretty solid to yeah. hold those tiles up, aren't you? Is it likely that we've either missed it somewhere in here or that another timber slot like that was actually somewhere out over that way? I would think that's probably the most... Well, we're not going to get that now, Likely, are we? Yeah. I mean, so, anyway, we can't win them all, can no. we? No, so mm. can we stop now? Yeah, I think you should stop now. <laughs> Lots of tired diggers around, including those working in the gateway trench. But it's all been worth it, according to Phil. What you're looking at is one of the towers of the entrance. Really? This is the actual base of it. Cool. Now, you see, I'm, I'm now outside that, that tower. Right. Phil's found evidence of a timber post that he thinks was holding back this concentration of rubble. Sometimes the gateways to timber castles were rebuilt in stone at a later date, but we can't see enough of the evidence to be sure if this is the case yeah. here. And then Phil's theory is that the rubble may be the base of one of the towers of the gateway. Ah, right, so what right. you've got is the main entrance into the castle there, yeah. and you've got a corresponding tower probably underneath that tree. Now, in fact, uh, Rob, you got that drawing? Oh, yeah. Yes. You see, this might make life a little easier. Ah, right. Did you get yeah, the gist yeah. of it? Yeah, We yeah, started yeah. off there yeah. with this revetting. Yeah. We walked along there, and we're now standing there, and the entranceway yeah. goes straight through there. So we were wrong when we thought this might be a sort of road or something coming up through. Yeah. It's, it's actually the base of something. 
Ladies and gentlemen, as you probably know, you have a madman in your midst who bought a castle and a moat. <laughs> We've got lots to tell Derek and the villagers of Alderton. Firstly, the people have been living on this ridge of higher ground since prehistoric times. The unusual shape of the monument suggests it may once have been part of something else. Most likely a fortified Saxon site called a burr, which could have looked something like this. However, the clearest and most spectacular evidence belongs to the Norman Ringwork Castle. This reconstruction shows how it might have looked when it was first built, which we now know was in the 11th century. Its size reflecting the status of the man who built it, Robert, Count of Mortain, half-brother to William the Conqueror. We found evidence of the gateway and discovered what we think was an annex to the castle. Finally, we know that the castle was abandoned around 1400. The last three days have been a bit of a battle, what with boundary disputes and English heritage inspectors getting nervous. And it's been a very complicated site to sort out, but it has been worth it. And the vision that I'll take away with me is of a 15th century knight thundering through the castle entrance, turning to admire the magnificent palisades. And just at that moment, something on his harness snapped and he dropped this. What were your best moments? I think the three best moments were seeing the um, 3D projection of this uh, castle of mine this morning without trees, uh, finding that uh, little emblem, that piece of horse harness over by the entrance gate. And uh, I think the third one actually was seeing the amount of beer that Phil Harding can put away in a short amount of time. <laughs>